Good morning, chemistry students. This is your ChemQuest 27 covalent bonding uh, teaching video. So, some terminology. Recall that an ionic bond results from the combination of a metal and a nonmetal. Note hydrogen is a nonmetal even though it is on the left side of the periodic table. A covalent bond is the type of bond between two nonmetals. Covalent bonds are formed by neutral atoms that share electrons rather than by charged ions. When a compound is formed by sharing electrons, the compound is called a molecule or molecular compound. It is important to note that ionic compounds are not called molecules. The largest class of molecules is called organic molecules. Carbon is the distinguishing mark of organic compounds. Use your knowledge of metals and nonmetals to identify each of the following as having ionic or covalent bonds. So again, if it's ionic, it's going to be a metal, oops, <laughs> not a good way to start, a metal and a nonmetal, or it contains a polyatomic ion. For covalent, it's going to be two nonmetals. Okay. So when you look at your periodic table, Calcium, remember our dividing line between metals and nonmetals is that heavy stair step line right here. So remember to the left and below um, the heavy stair step line are metals, and to the right and above are your nonmetals. So you're looking where they are on the periodic table. Calcium is on the left, it's in group 2A, so it's a metal, so this would be ionic. Magnesium is in group 2A, so it's a metal, so this would also be ionic. Carbon is a nonmetal, and hydrogen is a nonmetal, so this is covalent. Nitrogen and oxygen are both nonmetals, so this is covalent. Here's a polyatomic ion you have memorized, nitrate, so this is an ionic compound. And sulfur and oxygen are both nonmetals, so this is covalent. Number two, the compound NH4NO3 is an ionic compound, even though there isn't a metal in the compound. Explain why. Think about what NH4NO3 is made of. Again, it's made of two polyatomic ions. Therefore, it's an ionic compound. So because it's made of polyatomic ions, which is why I say that we say ionic compounds are a metal and a nonmetal, or they contain a polyatomic ion. Number three, circle any of the following compounds that would properly be called a molecule. Again, what we mean by molecule is that it's a molecular compound. So that means it's made of two nonmetals. So hydrogen is a nonmetal, oxygen's a nonmetal, so this would be called a molecule. Carbon's a nonmetal, fluorine's a nonmetal, so this would be called a molecule. Sodium's a metal, and this is chloride, so this is not, remember, this would be called a formula unit instead of a molecule because it's an ionic compound. Magnesium is a metal, so again, this would be a formula unit because it's an ionic compound. And N, nitrogen and oxygen are both nonmetals, so this would be called a molecule. Which compound from question three would be classified as organic and why? So remember, our definition of organic here is that they contain carbon. So we're looking for one of these that contains carbon. And it is B, carbon tetrachloride. And it's because organic means it's a molecular compound. That contains carbon. Right, naming covalent compounds. 
There are several prefixes used to name molecules. The name carbon oxide is not sufficient because carbon and oxygen sometimes form CO2 and sometimes CO. Prefixes are necessary to distinguish between them. Formula N2O4 dinitrogen tetroxide, SF6 sulfur hexafluoride, XeCl5 xenon pentafluoride, SO3 sulfur trioxide, CO carbon monoxide. So critical thinking questions. Number five, fill in the table to indicate which prefix is used to represent the numbers. The first one is done for you. So one, right, when we only have one oxygen here, the prefix is mono. So for two, somewhere where we have a two, right here we have a two and it is di. Somewhere we have a three, which is right here, and it is tri. A four is right here, and it's tetra. Five right here, it's penta. And six right here, and it's hexa. Now, these are not something you have to have memorized. I have the prefixes for you on your helper sheet. Okay, so you don't have to memorize those. So number six, name each of the following molecules using the appropriate prefixes similar to the table in the information section. So when we look at these, again, notice that, um, again, the prefix, okay, the subscript becomes a prefix, and also notice that all of our second elements end in ide. So N2O5. N is nitrogen, and 2 is di, so this is di-nitrogen. And 5 is penta, and oxygen becomes oxide, so pentoxide. Letter B, CF4. Again, this is a molecular compound. It's two nonmetals. So mono is really kind of optional on the first element. So monocarbon. And then 4 is tetra. So it would be tetra, and then fluorine becomes fluoride. SCl3, so again, I can have mono, and then S is sulfur. 3 is tri, and chlorine becomes chloride. And SO, again, I can have my mono, sulfur. And again, it's one, you always have to have the mono on the second element, so monoxide, because oxygen becomes oxide. Empirical formulas. Molecules can be represented by using either a molecular formula or an empirical formula. The molecular formula tells you exactly how many atoms of each element are in the compound. For example, in the table below, compound number two has exactly four carbons and eight hydrogens in each molecule. Observe the table below that shows five organic molecules along with a molecular, an empirical formula for each one. So again, here are the molecules. Here's the molecular formula. Here's the empirical formula. So number seven, here's a math question. Reduce or simplify the following fractions, right? Four to eight becomes... 1 to 2, or 1 half. 8 to 18, I can take a 2 out of both of those, so that becomes 4 to 9. Look at molecule number 2 and molecule number 4 in the table in the above information section. How is molecule number 2 similar to question 7a above? So, molecule number 2, notice I have C4H8, the empirical formula is CH2, right? Question the molecule number four, C8H18, C4H9. So how are they similar, right? So notice that the empirical formula for each compound is the simplest whole number ratio of the elements 
in the compound. Right? Three, or sorry, four to eight becomes one to two. Eight to 18 becomes four to nine. So what is an empirical formula? An empirical formula is always the lowest whole number ratio of atoms in a molecular compound. How, are molecule, how can molecules number one and number two have the same empirical formula even though they are different molecules? So again, notice we have two to four, which becomes one to two, four to eight, which becomes one to two. So again, how can they have the same empirical formula? Because the lowest whole number ratio of atoms in both compounds is the same. Given the empirical formula for a compound, is it possible to determine the molecular formula? If so, explain how. So what they're asking is, if you didn't see this molecular formula column here, would you be able to, using this, know what the molecular formula is? Okay. No, not without some additional information, right? There's not enough information there to know for sure. So given the molecular formula for a compound, is it possible to determine its empirical formula? So again, what they're saying here is, if I don't have my empirical formula, could I figure it out? Yeah, that you can do, right? Because it's just the lowest whole number ratio. So yes, just make the ratio of atoms in the compound the lowest whole number ratio. Basically, you're going to reduce it. So give the empirical formula for each of the molecules below. So N2O6, so I could take a 2 out of both of those, so it would be NO3 is my empirical formula. C2H4O2, I could take a factor of 2 out of all of those, so it's going to be CH2O. C4H14, I can take a factor of 2 out of those, so it's C2H7. And C3H5, well that I don't have something I can take out of, so this is the empirical formula. So, if you had some questions over this, I hope that helps. Have a great day. I'll talk to you tomorrow.